For a lot of Americans who lived through it, September 11th seemed to come out of nowhere. I, for one, certainly did not see it coming. I was a junior in high school, and I just couldn't understand why anyone would ever want to attack the United States of America. And nobody around me really had a very satisfying answer. The adults in my life couldn't figure it out any better than I could. My parents and my teachers couldn't really explain it. President George W. Bush told me it was because the terrorists hated our freedom, but that didn't make any sense. Americans are asking, why do they hate us? They hate what they see right here in this chamber, a democratically elected government. Their leaders are self-appointed. They hate our freedoms. It wasn't until I got to college that I started to get my first glimpse at the social forces, which I now believe led to 9-11. But I didn't learn about it in class. I learned about it from a video that I found somewhere on the internet, probably Newgrounds or something like that. It was the early days of video on the internet. But anyway, the video that I saw related the ideas from a 1992 book called Jihad versus McWorld. And that video gave me my first inkling as to why anyone would do what was done to the World Trade Center. Jihad vs. McWorld is a book by Benjamin Barber, which discusses the relationships between powerful, developed capitalist countries and the more downtrodden nations of the developing world. It's far from a perfect book, and given that it's almost 30 years old and was written almost a decade before 9-11, it's in some ways completely out of date, but in other ways clearly way ahead of its time. But anyway, the basic ideas within it I think are still worth considering, and at the time, in around 2002, when I saw the video that related those same ideas, they struck me as quite profound in comparison to the narrative that was being fed to me by the media, and especially by the USA back in the early 2000s. It was a lot more in depth and made a lot more sense than the terrorists hating us because of our freedom. So uh, let me quickly summarize Barber's points now. In the book, Barber examines the dialectical relationship between two very powerful social currents. The first of these mighty social forces he calls McWorld, and McWorld is basically the unrestrained neoliberal capitalist imperialist system. Specifically, this powerful movement of wealthy states and corporations working together led to the globalization of markets, globalized ecology, and globalized politics. In this McWorld of global capitalism, international laws and treaties had to be worked out in order to stabilize relations and to expand the free trade. Basically, corporations like things to be peaceful, according to the neoliberal idea and according to Barber in this book, because it makes for better business, generally speaking. Of course, the military industrial complex is a whole other bag of donut, uh, murder donuts, drone, drone nuts. Uh, the point is, that this stabilization occurred so that massive corporations could have both cheap workforces to produce goods and also so that they could have a global market to sell to. Because remember, the name of the game of capitalism is infinite expansion, which means you constantly need your market to grow. So that global capitalist market is very useful for giant corporations. This did have those superficial benefits of what seemed to be stability and peace, but it also came with massive drawbacks, like the erosion of independence, self-reliance, and self-determination for most nations on Earth. Under globalist neoliberal capitalism, according to Barber, nations could no longer practice autarky, self-reliance, and self-determination. In order to survive in this newly emerging global marketplace, nations instead had to open up to the global market. Finally, McWorld erodes national and cultural identities and waters down human society into a melange of corporate brands, corporate art, and consumerism. Anyone who's ever been to a shopping mall should have some basic idea of what I'm talking about. And we all know that film and television and music is pretty much a global business nowadays. Global capitalists manufacture and sell culture after all, and all of those products of culture need a constantly expanding global market. And in selling corporate culture far and wide, local culture gets supplanted. Barber also described the great opposing force to McWorld, which he problematically called Jihad. He argues that insular, exclusionary, xenophobic, theocratic terrorist groups, military juntas or juntas, uh, juntas, juntas, and dictatorships emerge and gain power in the developing world in opposition to the forces of McWorld. 
For Barber, these reactionary social forces manifest in cultures, religious sects, and splinter groups within larger nations where dissenting minority groups already feel oppressed and unheard by those existing state structures. He offers as examples Kurds, Basques, Puerto Ricans, Ossetians, East Timorians, Quebecois, the Catholics of Northern Ireland, Catalans, Tamils, and of course Palestinians, people with countries inhabiting nations not their own, seeking smaller worlds within borders that will seal them off from modernity. Now, as a solution to all these conflicting social forces, Barber proposes the idea of confederalism and democracy, basically building confederacies of smaller political communities which come together to form coalition states. Barber believes that these confederations can synthesize the oppositional forces of McWorld and the unfortunately named Jihad so that marginalized minority groups can still have political and cultural autonomy and independence while still serving the interests of the behemoth of global capitalist imperialist corporatism. Now, when I was 18 years old and reading these ideas for the first time, they appealed to me a lot. Uh, after all, they were very different from anything else I was seeing. They made a lot of sense on the surface, and I basically synthesized them into my youthfully naive right-wing libertarian perception of the world. Barber talked about building smaller, more limited, more democratic political structures, which could grant the people as much liberty as possible while still serving and being served by the free market. Pretty close to my right-wing libertarian ideas that I cringily held at the time. While Barber was prescient and astute in being able to detect and describe many of those dialectical contradictions between global capitalism and the people of the global south, and I do think he was able to correctly identify a lot of the frustrations and tensions felt by those who live in cultures that were being devastated by neoliberal market globalization, I do think that where his analysis fell apart ultimately comes down to his viewpoint. By viewpoint here, I refer to the starting point of analysis, which determines the direction of thinking from which problems are considered. Barber strikes me as having what Mark Fisher might describe as a capitalist realist viewpoint. He was able to identify many of the problems of capitalism, especially the neoliberal form of global capitalist imperialism, which was coming into primacy when he wrote Jihad versus McWorld, but he just couldn't imagine a world without capitalism. From his perspective, capitalism is an unavoidable aspect of reality. Therefore, Barber's analysis can only proceed towards solutions which maintain and preserve those systems of capitalist imperialism. In the book, Barber ruthlessly interrogates capitalism and he offers endless criticism and admonishment of the harm which the free market does to humanity and the world. But he believes that democracy can somehow serve as a tool which can negate those harmful aspects of both McWorld and Jihad. Look, that's the term he used, I'm sorry. As Barber writes, democracies prefer markets, but markets do not prefer democracies. Having created the conditions that make markets possible, democracy must also do all the things that markets undo or cannot do. But Barber also observes that democracy can't simply be implemented overnight. He writes that democracies are built slowly, culture by culture, each with its own strengths and needs over centuries. Democracy is not a universal prescription for some singularly remarkable form of government. It is an admonition to people to live in a certain fashion, responsibly, autonomously, yet on common ground, in self-determining communities, somehow still open to others with tolerance and mutual respect, yet a firm sense of their own values. So this is a very idealist conception that if we all have the proper outlook, if we all have the proper ideological positions, if we all have the proper moral perpetuity, then we can solve these problems through the power of democracy. It's not really that different from the positions that Proudhon held, which Marx heavily criticized, but that's neither here nor there. There's a great book you can read if you want to, uh, but it's like 40 freaking dollars and I can't find a place to get it for cheaper, but it's a good book if you want to read it. Anyway, Butler goes on to write that these lessons would not be so hard for the complacent denizens of McWorld and the angry brothers of Jihad if the idea of civil society had retained its currency among those who call themselves Democrats today. But battered by history and squeezed between two equally elephantine state and private market sectors, civil society has fairly vanished both as theory and as democratic practice. Hey, uh, editor EJ here. Quick note, uh, a few things I forgot to mention in the script. First of all, I think that Barber's commentary on civil society in this book is very interesting. Antonio Gramsci was another person who talked a lot about civil society. Uh, Gramsci was an Italian Marxist, and I've done a video about Gramsci's ideas. I'll put a link in the description. 
But Gramsci thought that civil society was actually sort of the glue that held capitalism together and built a sort of false consciousness and caused the working class to sort of work against its own interests and also kind of allied sort of the upper echelons of the working class and the petty bourgeoisie to sustain capitalism. And he said that because Russia never had such a strong civil society and it was a much more exclusive civil society that really only included the nobles. That was why the USSR managed to have its revolution and all of the revolutions in Europe failed. It's just very interesting and I think that Gramsci's take on civil society is way closer to hitting the mark than Barber's, but it's also interesting to note that a lot of the places in which there have been not necessarily socialist or communist reactions and uh, pushback to imperialism, but in places where we see pushback to imperialism, there has seemed to be this sort of same breakdown of civil society. So I think Barber kind of came close to hitting the nail on the head and had some pretty interesting observations about civil society, but because it wasn't a class conscious analysis, it missed the mark in a lot of ways. Also, I just really wanna note that Overall, I find Barber's analysis of quote unquote jihad to be a lot more lackluster compared to his analysis of neoliberal capitalism. I think that he conflates way too many cultures. He kind of glosses over the deep impact that centuries of colonialism and nation building wrought by uh, imperialist forces from Europe and the USA. I don't think that his analysis of you know the, the developing world was nearly as astute as his analysis of the developed world. And finally, I don't think that the answer to the question, why did September 11th happen, is really totally found in the book. Uh, it was written nine years before September 11th, so that would be a lot to ask of any book. But yeah, I mean, it, it points you in the right direction in some ways, it offers you some clues, but the real story of why September 11th happened goes beyond the scope of this video and certainly can't really be found in Jihad versus Muck World. Anyway, back to the video. As I was saying before, Barber's solution to resolving all of these problems was simply to strike a balance between the over-centralized nature of the modern Federalist nation state and all of those fracturings and splinterings of separatism with democratic confederalism. But this prescription comes off as deeply unsatisfying in the book. Even Butler admits that the democratic option sounds improbable and utopian, but he dismisses this by simply saying that democratic confederalism is better than the alternatives of foreign invasion, partition, and resettlement on the one hand, and giving into the overreaching power of mega corporate capitalist markets and those abusive capitalist entities on the other. Even Butler, however, doesn't seem convinced in this solution, ending the book by saying that democracy may now become our first and only hope in resolving all these contradictions, but not really giving any kind of an idea as to how that would actually work or what that would look like or what we would need to do to apply that formula. It's really a pretty bleak and tepid read once you finish it. It offers very little in the way of hope and it's all because Barber can't imagine a world without capitalism. The way Barber talks about the destruction wrought by capitalism in the world, it seems like capitalism is this unescapable, unavoidable force of nature. Like a hurricane or an earthquake. He, he, he writes as if capitalism is not a human constructed system which can be deconstructed, but rather some intrinsic law of nature like gravity. For those reasons, I find McWorld versus Jihad to be a fascinating read because it does show how important having a proper viewpoint, an accurate viewpoint really is. Without a good viewpoint, without a good starting point for your analysis, it doesn't matter how solid your ensuing analysis might be, you're never going to reach a solid conclusion. You have got to start with a good first basis. McWorld versus Jihad has a very strong middle, and Butler is very good at pointing out relations and connections and identifying pain points within the complex system that is global human society. But because he begins with such a highly flawed capitalist realist viewpoint, his ending sucks big time. The book feels weighty and pithy and solid right up until the last five pages or so when it suddenly falls apart into waffling indecision and only the most lackluster defense of his own solution of democratic confederalism. Exactly 20 years ago today, as of the time I'm recording this on September 11th, 2001, the West was presented with a similar viewpoint crisis. Looking back, it feels like the attacks on the World Trade Center shook the foundations of that viewpoint, which was held by the vast majority of the so-called Western world. 
that viewpoint that we were marching unwaveringly forward towards a bright and prosperous future. The Soviets had been defeated, history was over, and it would all be smooth sailing from now on. As the forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and so many of those surrounding nations have come into full swing and the trouble and contradictions of capitalism come to the forefront, and we're now faced with devastation to our climate as we are facing a pandemic, which the developing world cannot seem to contain or just chooses not to contain because it's not profitable to do so. We've been struggling so hard to find solid ground ever since. I think it seems by now to most people that it is quite clear that the promises of global capitalism will never be delivered on. And so the people of the world seem to be reaching for other solutions. Unfortunately, for far too many people in far too many places, this has been leading to the development of fascistic viewpoints. That is, rather than correctly attributing the problems we're facing to the capitalist form of political economy and all of the underlying systems of oppression which prop it up, which have dominated virtually the entire world, these far-right extremists are instead scapegoating marginalized groups of people. It's not capitalism that's causing all these problems, it's foreigners, it's gay people, it's those people, those other people that are causing all of these problems. Many others are offering up technocratic solutions to capitalism. They say that we can make capitalism work, we just need to tinker with it. We need to make a, a few adjustments here and there. That's all we gotta do. And these promises echo the solutions proposed by Barber in Jihad versus McWorld. We just need a mixed economy that offers a little more welfare here, a few tax breaks on electric cars there, get things balanced and booyah, capitalism can just keep on doing its thing and we're gonna be fine. That's kind of the Joe Biden approach to addressing these problems. But the fact is, as we all know, there's only one viewpoint that can really lead to the proper conclusions as to what needs to be done about capitalism, and that's the communist viewpoint that capitalism must be abolished entirely. As Barber pointed out almost 30 years ago, capitalism destroys human lives, it erases human cultures, and it is devastating our environment. If Barber had begun with this viewpoint, that capitalism has got to go, then I'm sure they, that that viewpoint would have led to much better prescriptions and conclusions as to what needs to be done to solve these problems. Unfortunately, we on the anti-capitalist left in the West are having a severe viewpoint crisis of our own. While we may all agree on the basic viewpoint that capitalism sucks and needs to end, we just can't seem to figure out where to begin in ending it. And obviously we aren't going to agree on everything and nobody should be expected to work with folks that they can't trust. I'm not some kind of idealist leftist utopian who thinks that we can all hold hands and march forward together without any conflict and strife, but we do have to unite the working class somehow or another. We gotta find some kind of basic agenda that we can agree on and then propagate to the masses, don't we? I mean, somehow we've gotta get united if we ever hope to overthrowing this incredibly powerful system of interlocking oppressions. And if you ask me, a lot of us spend way too much time quibbling over random hypotheticals which have absolutely nothing to do with the clear and present dangers of our present situation. And instead of stepping up to organize and take action against the capitalist hegemony which is wreaking so much havoc on our lives, we're engaging in fruitless debates about things that just don't matter right now at all. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be so bold as to pretend that I do know all the answers about where exactly we should begin. I don't even think there is a one-size-fits-all answer to that question. As Marx put it in the 1872 preface to the Communist Manifesto, the practical application of the principles will depend, as the manifesto itself states, everywhere and at all times on the historical conditions for the time being. So it's up to you to figure out where you got to begin. You got to look at your material conditions and make those choices. But if I can offer one piece of advice, it's please base your analysis and focus your efforts on those actual material conditions, the objective social relations that surround you. Take a look at where you are in the world and take a look at your surroundings and the people around you. Know where you wanna go, know where you are right now, and then work out how to get from here to there in the real material world. Focus on that. Don't get distracted by useless bickering about things that have nothing to do with what we need to accomplish right now. Focus on the work at hand and you will find yourself much less distracted 
and you will find yourself much more productive. That's what I have found as I have done a lot of work to shed myself of idealist hypotheticals and, and stop getting so worked up about things that just don't matter right now. I've been getting a lot more done and I hope that you find that to be the case for yourself as well. Anyway, I have got to believe because the alternative is so horrible that soon, despite all of our differences, we will realize that we do share at least one common viewpoint. And that's the most important viewpoint of all right now. And it's the viewpoint that capitalism must end and end rapidly if we were to have any hope of surviving the challenges we face today. As Lucy Parsons wrote, let us sink such differences as nationality, religion, politics, and set our eyes eternally and forever toward the rising star of the industrial republic of labor. Remembering that we have left the old behind and have set our faces toward the future, there is no power on earth that can stop men and women who are determined to be free at all hazards. There is no power on earth so great as the power of intellect. It moves the world and it moves the earth. I hope even now to live to see the day when the first dawn of the new era of labor will have arisen, when capitalism will be a thing of the past, and the new industrial republic, the commonwealth of labor, shall be in operation. Lucy Parsons did not get to live to see that world, but perhaps you and I shall. So I don't expect you to agree with everything I have to say, and I don't demand that you work with me, but I do encourage you to work with someone and get something done because time is running out. So thanks for watching. I'm EJ. This is Non-Compete. We'll see you next time. And one quick note, I want to thank everyone who's been supporting us on Patreon because that is the only reason I'm able to keep this channel going. Uh, we do have a new platform that we're on, and I'm very excited to announce it. It is Comraderie, a cooperatively owned, anti-capitalist, anti-fascist alternative to Patreon. Right now it is in alpha, but it's pretty cool. Uh, it doesn't allow us to give perks or private posts like Patreon does. So if that's important to you, um, maybe just consider Patreon if you want to support us. Uh, but yeah, if you just want to donate a few bucks, um, check out Comraderie. All the money goes to us except for the processing fees, all of it. So it's pretty cool. I think there's a, a small uh, platform share, but that's it. It's way more money comes to the creators than on Patreon, like way, 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 way more. So uh, definitely check it out. And if you're a creator, apply and sign up. It's really cool. Um, but yeah, there's no pressure. I know a lot of people are strapped for cash right now, so no pressure whatsoever. But if you decide you want to support non-compete, camaraderie is a cool new way to do it. Anyway, uh, yeah, thanks to everybody who's been supporting us. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Go out there and make sure you support other leftist creators as well. Or don't. Do what you want. I'm not your dad. Or am I? How old are you? Who's your mom? I don't think I'm your dad, but I might be. We'll talk about it. Bye.